Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who. Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not. I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the big Biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Arnel Dolion, and hopefully your day is going bueno. Wherever you are, wherever you are, hopefully your life is going well, going bueno. Things are cooling down here in Los Angeles. Things seem like they're normalizing. People are walking around at times without masks. We got uh, places like New Zealand. I just watched the UFC countdown with Israel Asanya and Jan Bogovics. And in New Zealand, things are pretty much normal. Normal. There was footage of Israel Asanya walking into this gigantic football stadium. When I say football, I mean traditional football, not the American one. And you see this gigantic pack of crowds. You got a pack of crowds, no masks, none. I didn't even see them like doing testing. You got all these people sitting right with one another. And it looked very similar to the Super Bowl, where if you're watching the Super Bowl, you would notice there's like people sitting, partying right next to one another, not fulfilling the six feet thing. And when I saw that, and considering that things are going on for New Zealand, and in Los Angeles cases are dropping, it seems like we are seeing the lights in the end of the tunnel here. Things are going all bueno. Now, ironically enough, my friends, they are panicking increasingly, as which is you know perfectly understandable. We went from a year of, all right, let's stay home, to now, okay, it might be the right time to leave our homes and become normal people again. And it's scary. It really is. Especially for a lot of those who've been adjusted to staying at home. But you know what? While I've been staying at home, I've been watching a whole lot of sports, a whole lot of mixed martial arts, a whole lot of basketball, a whole lot of boxing. And I am incredibly amped and excited for UFC 259 happening Saturday, March 6th, 7 p.m. Western Pacific Time. At the UFC Apex Facility Building, it'll be available on pay-per-view, and let's go and cross our fingers here that hopefully, hopefully, that things are going to go bueno, ESPN Plus isn't going to go bogged down, I'm going to be watching the prelims, and when I switch over to the main pay-per-view event, let's hope that's going to go and be all good. The show isn't going to be, we are not going to go see like the final two fights, because this entire card... Is full of really fight is full of really good fights with top rank champions, rank contenders, former champions from the prelim card to the main card. Heck, I'm looking straight now. Even in the early prelims, we have Jordan Espinoza versus Tim Elliott, Mario Batista against Trevin Jones, Alan Cruz against Euros Medix, Jake Matthews versus Sean Brady. Even in the early prelims. We got prospects, former top contenders, and fighters moving up the rankings that could pull off amazing performances. In the prelims here, we have Roger Baturin against Kai Kara France. If you don't know Kai Kara France, this guy is a show stealer. I would say Kai Kara France, amongst everyone who is in this card, is arguably the most exciting striker in the entire show. I know you're like saying, Kai Kara France... Really? This guy? Like, who is Kaikar France? I've never heard of him. He fights a bunch of times in the prelims. Trust me, Kaikar France, he is an amazing kickboxer. He's against somebody in Roger Baton, and they can steal the show. Joseph Benavides against Askar Askarov. This could be a huge shift in the men's flight rankings. Song Yadong versus Kyler Phillips. Dominic Cruz versus Casey Kenny. Yes, Dominic Cruz, former Bantamy champion. Main event of the prelim card will be competing. And then we get to the main card here. 
We have Jan Blachowicz versus, Iz- versus Izzo Adesanya being the main event for the light heavyweight title. Champion versus champion. Amanda Nunes versus Megan Anderson for the women's feather title. This could potentially be the last time we see the women's feather division. Peter Jan versus Aljamain Sterling for the bantamweight title. Out of these three fights here, who's most likely to lose her belt? Probably Peter Jan. Islam Makachev against Drew Dober. Dargo Sadez versus Alexander Rakish. The lightweight and the light heavyweight bout has huge stakes in their respective divisions. So knowing that, UFC 259 is a stacked card and today's show is going to be doing a preview of each fight. What are my expectations of the fights? In the end, I'll go give a news brief of what's going on in the world of MMA. And the fight I want to talk about, obviously, would have to be the main event. Jan Baklahovics, who is the current UFC light heavyweight champion versus Israel Adesanya. There are a lot of question marks in this fight here. The betting odds for Vegas have not been released yet. They have not been released yet. And I was doing a discussion with my friends about this fight. Now, me and my friends, we're huge anime nerds. We love geek culture and nerd culture. So obviously we're all pulling for Izzy Adesanya. But even though I want Izzy to win, I am predicting Jean Blachowicz to go win the spout. And the reason I'm picking Jean Blachowicz to go win the spout is because I'm looking back in the fights that Izzy Adesanya had with two specific fighters who had the highest odds of beating him. And that were Rob Whitaker and Kelvin Gastelum. Those two fighters were the closest ones to defeat Izzy in the sense that they're the two fighters who were able to find openings and find and pick apart their shots on Izzy. There were exchanges between Izzy and those two fighters that you're looking at it, and there is an alternative universe out there that if Paulo Costa were to fight that style that Kevin Gaslam brought and Winnerker brought when they fought Izzy, Paulo Costa could have won. Paulo Costa, when he fought Izzo Adesanya... He fought this calculating championship style, and I hate it. I it, it's, it bothers the heck out of me, where we got challengers winning via the point system and in a non-dominating fashion. Because you can be like someone like Khabib, and you can go dominate your opponents, but you're still winning via the point system. And for Adesanya versus Paula Costa, Costa fought in a specific way that made him unrecognizable relative to his other fights. Paulo Costa, he just goes there full on aggro, and the build to the fight was Paulo Costa, he will be the one chasing Izzo Adesanya. And instead, what happened was these two fighters were still meeting one another, and Izzy kept poking Paulo Costa over and over again, and that form of aggression, that aggro that was being built up for Paulo Costa never materialized. Never did. And the only two fighters who were able to be ultra aggressive and find their shots was Gastelum and Whitaker. And knowing that, what would happen if you replaced the aggression, if you if you replaced the shots from Whitaker and Kim Gastelum with Jean Blachowicz? What would happen? Well, Izzy, the guy is deceptively a tank and he's taken many shots. There are instances where if you can overwhelm the guy and you don't turn this to a chess match. Izzy usually wins in these 50-50 exchanges just because his striking accuracy is so on point and he's deceptively tanky and very durable. I do not think Israel Asanya is able to get away with doing certain things to Jean Blachowicz compared to his other fighters. Because Israel Asanya, for one, this guy, he loves poking his opponents. He's a counter striker for the most part. He's usually backing away. He's kind of similar to Anderson Silva in the sense you got these two counter strikers who tempt their opponents to come into their range and then they poke him out with one really good counter strike. That's usually how it is for Izzo Sanya. And for Jean Blachowicz, Jean Blachowicz, when he fought against Dominic Reyes, it was kind of like that where Jean Blachowicz was chasing after Dominic Reyes while Reyes is backing away and... When you look at Black Oaks versus Dominic Reyes, from an aesthetic point of view, you could be like, all right, Dominic Reyes is the better technical boxer. Dominic Reyes is landing the better shots. He is faster. 
His angling of shots is a lot more better. But Blackovic only needs one shot. That's all he needs. And the same thing can apply for John Blackovic versus Izzo Adesanya. Where he'd be like, Adesanya is the better boxer, better kickboxer. His angling shots of better. But the Polish hammer. One shot. Polish power. John Blackovic, what I predict is... The two fighters are going to meet each other in the center of the octagon. They'll meet each other in the octagon. Adesanya is going to throw in some leg kicks. Adesanya has got them greater reach. And Adesanya will, might win. He might win out first and second round. I'm predicting first and second round, Adesanya is defeating Blackwicks. But in those two rounds, there will be instances where you're like, oh my goodness, John Blackwicks. If he just lands a couple shots, a couple clean shots, he can come away with a knockout victory and could overwhelm Adesanya. And that's my prediction here, where Adesanya wins first and second round, and then in the third round, that's where things begin falling apart, where Blackwicks, he's going to figure out Adesanya's range. He's going to go figure out, okay, I know the timing here. I know where he's, what his openings are. I can find the anglings here. And Black is going to clip Adesanya. And then, it might be a possibility of Adesanya getting knocked out by that clip. Or we go into the 4th and 5th round, where Adesanya then becomes very tentative. And John Blackowicz just tears apart Adesanya. Now, is he going to knock out Adesanya? I'm not sure. I say Blackowicz knocks out Adesanya in the 3rd round. If not in the 3rd round, then Blackowicz is going to win the fight by overwhelming Adesanya through th- through the third, fourth, and fifth round. Adesanya wins first and second round. That's what I'm going to go for. John Blackwick, he is not a dumb fighter. This guy is slow. He's calculating. He's very smart. High fight IQ. And he was able to go find the right counters and to time his shots perfectly against Reyes. And Nova is Adesanya. He has never fought, never fought, somebody who is as strong, who is as big, as John Blackovics. Yes, Paulo Costa. He's a big guy. He's very strong. Paulo Costa really is a light heavyweight. He was competing at middleweight. Alright then. But Paulo Costa, he himself has not competed amongst the Giants. He hasn't competed against light heavyweights. He hasn't competed against the heavyweights. John Blackovics, yes, he competed against both heavyweights and at light heavyweights. And I do know Adesanya's background in kickboxing where... He did compete at heavyweights. He did. But that's kickboxing. In MMA, it's a lot more different because there are other aspects in the fight game that you were thinking about and you're just unsure of what the result would be in an MMA, you know, cage. And for Adesanya, yes, he competed against bigger guys. But I also am a firm believer that is is Adesanya. He will be overwhelmed by the power of Blackovic. He will be surprised by the angling of shots for Blackovic. And Jean Blackwitz is will no, he will defend his light heavy title and win the bouts either by third round KO or by split decision. With Blackovic in my scorecards winning the fights by third, fourth, and fifth round. First second round, Adesanya. Because it takes time for Blackwix to go and figure out, you know, where exactly is he going to go find his shots. But is it Asanya for as much as I want to see the guy beat Blackwix and then challenge John Jones at heavyweights? It's very hard. It's very hard to throw... Okay, see, is it Asanya? There are reports leading up to this where his natural walk-around weight is 203 pounds. Natural walk-around weight. John Blagovic's, his natural walk-around weight is 230. There is a near 30-pound difference between the two fighters and their natural weights. Yes, Adesanya is tall. And yes, Adesanya has competed before against bigger guys. But he's not been conditioned to fighting against bigger guys in the octagon. And I, me, and all my friends were all discussing about this. I'm like, we gotta put money on the bigger guy. Now, there's been instances where... The bigger guys don't always win. I mean, look at Junior Santos. The guy is a small heavyweight. He is one of the more smaller heavyweights 
and he is one of the hardest hitters in UFC heavyweight history. But because there is a lot more evidence that shows that John Blackwicks has competed against bigger guys, stronger guys, who I think are as strong as Izzy, I'm going to go pick John Blackwicks. Now, I could be completely wrong here, and that Adesanya could pull off a huge upset in terms of knocking out Blackwicks in the first round. Same way, it was a huge surprise that Adesanya was able to knock out Paula Costa, which is a prediction that majority of people did not predict. Anything can happen in the world of mixed martial arts. I picked Blackwicks winning, but I will be cheering on for Izzy Adesanya. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back after a short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So the co-main event is Megan Anderson versus Matt Nunes for the women's featherweight title. And I've been saying it for months now. And that I am a firm believer that the women's featherweight division is going to be retired. It's going to be retired. And we're going to see a women's anime division. Now, the reasoning as to why I'm saying this is because Dana White, in several interviews have said that he is looking to go and bolster up and focus in on the women's bantamweight division. Which means that we could see bigger women from other divisions who compete either at the lightweight, which we have seen in PFL, or at featherweight, go and compete at bantamweight. I think that is the right choice, that is the right decision. The bantamweight division right now is lacking prospects. It's very strong, Within like the top six, top seven, but going outside of top ten, who are the prospects that you're like, oh man, that's the fighter who I really do believe is gonna go and become the next big star in the bantamweight division? Well, we're not really sure, are we? We really don't know. And also, Dana White, when asked about this, he was asked several times about the possibility of having a women's anime division, and he goes on to say that if it wasn't for COVID. We could have seen an anime division that it's been in talks, it's been discussed for an anime division, and I think that would be absolutely amazing. I think anime division, it would create a much more competitive division than what they were going for, for the featherweights. I understand they wanted to make a division based all around Chris Cyborg, which didn't pan out in the end. And for the animates, I think it'd be great. We've seen it a lot of times where there are fighters coming in from Victa who are former champions, and then they go for they, they go over to the UFC as either a former anime competitor or an anime champion, and they're just struggling. Like, Jing Yu Frey perfectly embodies this. Stellar fighter, awesome at atom weights. And then she goes to straw weights, and then she's mildly struggling. There are other fighters who would benefit and would be able to compete a lot more better in the anime division, and considering the fact that the Strider division, in my opinion, is the best division right now in terms of its deep talent, you can bring some of the women from the Strawweights and move them over to Adam Weights. Like, we could see there's a real possibility that fighters like Jessica Andrade or Rose Lamias are open to competing at Adam Weights. Michelle Watterson, like Michelle Watterson and Claudia Cadella, two fighters who are stuck in this position as Dreaming Fighters in the Strider division, they can move it out to Adam Weights. And Michelle Watterson is a natural atom weight who is competing at straw weights. Because she came in as a former atom weight champion. Knowing that though, 
I believe that this fight here between Anderson and Amanda Nunes could potentially be the last time we are going to see a women's fighter division, uh, a women's fighter title match, at least for the next couple of years. Dana White, he's never discussed, he's never been high on the women's fighter division. There have been people who have been mumbling and being like, oh man, wouldn't it be exciting to see a women's anime division? The women's fighter division, if you go on UFC.com and you look at the rankings, there are no rankings. There are none. And I don't think there will be rankings. And here's the thing. Amanda Nunes, she has not defended her woman's bantamweight belt for over a year. And to me, that's unhealthy. It's an unhealthy division because we have Jermaine Duranime, who, upon losing to Amanda Nunes, had to fight, had to like wait for well over a, like about almost two years just to get another opportunity, which may or may not happen some point this year. It's very unhealthy right now. I think it is incredibly unhealthy to have a fighter hold two belts from two different, two different divisions. It never pans out well. Whether it be Darren Cormier, Henry Cejudo, Conor McGregor. Let's look at the Israel Asanya versus John Blackwicks. Glover Shera should be next up in line fighting for the light heavy title. And so should also Robert Whitaker. But they're not. The opportunity for them to go get gold has been taken away for this champion with champion bout, which by the I am happy that we're gonna see this that we're seeing this champion with champion bout. But I'm a firm believer that if a fighter wants to go move up in rankings, they have to vacate their title. That's what I believe. Because there's no the idea of like, oh wow, you have two belts, which means double responsibilities. No, you don't. You don't. You can have an entire year dedicated to one division and another t- another year de- dedicated to another division. And Amanda Nunes was able to do so. And when Harry Zahuda was the, both the flyweight and the bantamweight champion, one division was pretty much non-existent for a while. Because he was champion like both divisions, so like what's going on there? For Amanda Nunes versus Miki Anderson, I was talking to Sarah Tate about this, where she was discussing on what her prediction was on the fights. And it was expected that if Miki Anderson can go pull through in the early... In the early facets of the fights, the first and second round, there's a real possibility that Miguel Anderson might pull away and do better than Amanda Nunes in the tail in the fights, going to the fourth and fifth rounds in the championship rounds. Because Amanda Nunes, it's been proven that she slows down significantly as the fight goes on. But I will say this though, every fighter, as almost every fighter, or almost really fighters, except like Max Holloway, these fighters usually slow down by the tail in the fights. There's no way a fighter is keeping up the same consistent pace in the 4th and 5th round compared to how they were fighting in the 1st and 2nd round. It normally does, It normally works like that. And so for Nunez, yes, she will slow down in the latter half of the fight here. But if you've been keeping with Amanda Nunez in her two recent bouts with Spencer and GDR, she's pretty much changed her fighting style. She has. In the hype package for Amanda Nunes, they're constantly showing Amanda Nunes knocking people out left and right with leg kicks, with punches, knockout power. But guess what? Amanda Nunes, in her past two bouts, has changed herself from being this knockout artist to the striker you gotta be you gotta be in afraid of, that you are in fear of, to now somebody who is perfectly fine wrestling and grappling with you throughout the entirety of the fight. While keeping a high level and a high pace in ground control. In her fight against GDR, a lot of people were talking about like, oh my gosh, GDR, she found, you know, a chink in Amanda Nunes armor. Because Amanda Nunes is now developing as a grappler, as a wrestler. She's now choosing wrestling and grappling over striking. And that made sense for that fight. It made sense that Jermaine Aranime, who, although is an amazing kickboxer, lacks grappling. So it made sense for Amanda Nunes to be like, okay, I'm not going to take the risk here striking with this girl because she clipped me a handful of times. I'm going to just wrestle her. And that's what Nunes does. She wrestled you, and she won the fight via decision. Now, is it the most exciting way ever? No, no, it's not. Amanda Nunes, she's developed a certain style that is great for her in the long term in terms of her avoiding physical damages that's more focused in on cardio more than anything else. And in her battle against Felicia Spencer, the predictions going to this bout here was, all right, 
We have Spencer the Grappler versus the Striker in Nunez. And guess what happened? Immediately, within the span of just a minute in the first round, Nunez takes on Felicia Spencer. And they became five rounds of a man Nunez grappling and wrestling with the wrestler in Felicia Spencer. Knowing this, who's to say that Amanda Nunez is still not going to go and become the wrestler in her bout against Megan Anderson? And if you've been looking up on how Amanda Nunez has been doing, she loves being a mother. She's going to motherhood. Uh, she's got a family. She's settling down. She's had talks about retirement about retiring. She is. She seems like she's way more focused on securing her life and you know like making it long. And she can do that by not fighting this reckless style that we know Amanda Nunes, who usually does this, as she made her way up to the uh, top in becoming the Women's Bantamweight Champion. So Nunez, she changed her style. She's no longer the reckless striker. She's now the grappler. And she is deceptively strong. Miggy Anderson, if you look at her performances against Spencer, against Norma Dormont, against Holly Holm, me Anderson has a tendency for the first minute and 15 seconds of all her fights to being susceptible to clinching. Now, does Me Anderson have really good knockout power? Yeah, she does. Is her jiu-jitsu game really good? Heck yeah, it is. You saw her in her bout against Zarafen Dos Santos. Her jiu-jitsu is really good and underrated. But I doubt that Miggy Anderson can pull off what she's done in her recent like opponents to Amanda Nunez. She's never fought anybody who was as physically dominant or as strong as Nunez. And me Anderson pretty much got dominated by Spencer's grappling. If Miggy Anderson is struggling with the grappling of Fisher Spencer, who's to say that she'll struggle grappling with Amanda Nunez? Who proved that she was much more stronger than Felicia Spencer, better at, the gra- better at the ground control, and was just a better grappler than her when they had their title fights. So what the way how I'm predicting, predicting this fight to go would be both fighters meet up, center of the octagon, they try to feel each other out, Mana Nunez shoots in for a single leg, she presses up Megan Anderson onto the cage, slowly working for a takedown, and then... Amanda Nunez does a leg trip, brings down Miggy Anderson. Miggy Anderson does attempt a triangle choke from bottom position. And then Nunez is able to fight it off, brings her back to the ground, does some ground pound action, and then controls her for the rest of the first round. And Miggy Anderson will exert so much energy trying to get away from bottom position that as we go to the tail end of the second round, third, fourth, fifth, She's not going to go and keep all that energy. She'll be taken down by Nunez. And Nunez, although I'm going to say this right now, it's not going to be the most exciting fight out there. I wish it was because both these women are exciting. Both the way how Amanda Nunez, how she's presenting herself, with the way how she's been shifting in her fighting style, I can see Nunez grappling with Megan Anderson. Me Anderson attempting to do a couple submissions from bottom position. But Nunez is going to win via UNAS decision. And she's going to go prolong her life and her career as a mixed martial artist. So do not be surprised if you see the hype packages. And it's like, look at Man Nunez, the lioness, the goat of the women's division. She's going to go in there and she'll knock out people with like one punch knockout power. She'll do head kicks. She's going to destroy you. No, not really. She's going to go in there and she's going to fight the smart fight. She'll fight the smart fight. She's going to bring it down to the ground. She's going to control you with her power. She's going to hit you with some ground and pound action. She's going to overwhelm Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson will try to get out of it. But for the most part, she will definitely struggle. She'll be ground controlled. And also, here's the thing. Amanda Nunes, her clinch work is severely underrated. Very underrated. And Megan Anderson's versus the clinches. So who's to say that me that Amanda Nunes clinches with Megan Anderson... They go to the cage, and then Nunez starts pulling off uppercuts. I still have yet to see Miggy Anderson handle herself in the clinch appropriately without getting taken down or without being overwhelmed. I have yet to see that. So, man, Nunez is my pick to go and defeat Miggy Anderson. Now, once again, I can be completely wrong in this. We could see a huge surprise 
Anderson pulling off the triangle choke from bottom position. That can be a possibility. Anderson pulling off an uppercut as soon as it's attempting a takedown and getting the knockout victory. That could happen. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't think so. I think it's very likelihood of a man Nunes winning the bouts. Me Anderson is going to come in as a huge underdog, which is completely understandable. But Amanda Nunes, she will defeat Miguel Anderson. The woman's feather title will then be retired. Then we go to Amanda Nunes versus Jermaine Radme for the women's bantamweight title. And I'm excited for that bounce. I really am. Once again, this is not me being respectful to B.G. Anderson. I just think there's a higher chance of us seeing Amanda Nunes defeating Anderson. And then Nunes fighting against Jermaine Radme. And Jermaine Duranime, if you've been keeping up with her, has focused in on grappling. Focused on grappling, focused in on submission work. She is trying to revitalize her career, and she's trying to change herself from being a striker to a grappler, the same way how Man Nunez was able to change herself from a striker to a grappler. Though, if the women's fight division, if it does get retired, we could see Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer compete amongst the women's bantamweights. And I believe Anderson and Felicia Spencer... Those are the two women who really stood out in the women's fair division, or what was there in the women's fair division. And considering how strong they are, and considering their size, and the competition that they face in the fair division, I could see them do really well for themselves in the women's bantamweight division. Though, if Megan Anderson was able to pull off the upset victory, then the women's feather division will be saved. Megan Anderson will be the women's feather champion, while Amanda Nunes will continue to be the women's bantamweight champion. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back after the short break here. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we're back. Now let's go to our third title fight of the night for UFC 259. And that is between Peter Yan and Al Jermaine Sterling for the Bantamweight title. There was a poll that came up. And there was a discussion on... Among all the current champions, who do you believe are most likely to go and keep and or lose their title belts? And it was voted that Valentin Shevchenko, among all champions right now in the UFC is the one who is most likely to keep her belt. Peter Yan and Alexander Volkanovsky are the two fighters who are voted most likely to lose their belts. And for Peter Yan versus Aljamain Sterling, when I look at these two fighters here, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, this is a coin flip fight. <laughs> it's a proper coin flip fight because you can, one can say that, okay, Peter Yan, his speed is going to be too much for Sterling's. But then you look at the dominance that that Sterling had over Corey Sanhagen, and it's hard to imagine somebody like Aljamain Sterling ever being overwhelmed or being taken aback by anything Peter Yan is capable of doing. And because of that, it's such a proper coin flip fight. I'm picking Peter Yan winning. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to say it. I think Peter Yan will defeat Aljamain Sterling here. I think Peter Yan will be... He's way too fast, and he's too quick in his counter-strikes. 
and I can see instances where Aljamain Sterling will try to either engage Peter Yan. Peter Yan will, will be the one backpedaling for the majority of this fight here. Poking Sterling. If Sterling does go attempt for a takedown, I can go see Peter Yan being able to avoid that and landing some clean shots against Aljamain Sterling and grinding him out for three or five rounds of action. If I say who is most likely to win this fight by decision, Sterling. Who is most, who's most likely to win this fight by knockout? Peter Yan. Who is most likely to come away from this fight to accumulating the most total strikes and significant strikes? Peter Yan. And because of that, I got to pick Peter Yan successfully defending his Bantamweight title against Aljamain Sterling. Then we go to the lightweights with Drew Dober against Islam Akhachayev. Islam here, I'm pretty darn sure, is going to come in as the favorites going to the bout here. Islam Akhachev, he is an insanely darn good wrestler. And I don't think Drew Dober has ever fought somebody who is as good as of a grappler as Islam. And no, one thing about here. Whenever we see these Dagestan wrestlers, there's this idea that like, okay, the wrestlers just strike with them or just keep standing up with them. No, don't do that. Makachev is a underrated striker. All those, uh, all those grapplers coming in from Dagestan or from Russia, they are supremely good at striking, but no one really talks about their striking because we are so fixated and focused in onto their wrestling. So it's a two-way streak with Islam Makachev here. It's either you can deal with his striking, or you can have a better jiu-jitsu game and handle his grappling. And the way how I see it, I just don't see it being a real possibility of Drew Dober defeating Islam Makhachayev. Now, can I be completely wrong here? 100% I can be completely wrong here. But in terms of the cardio, in terms of the high the high work rates, and the chaotic energy of Islam Makhachayev, in terms of pressuring his opponents down with a flurry of strikes, then shooting in for a double takedown, or shooting for Tana, I don't think Drew Dober... He is fast enough in terms of reaction timing to deal with the striking of Islam, and I don't think he is grappling is anywhere near close to Islam Akashev. So Akashev is my pick to go win that bout. And then we go to the light heavyweight division with Diago Santos against Alexander Rakish. I'm unsure about this, but I will choose Diago Santos winning. And the reason why I chose Diago Santos winning is because Diago Santos, when he fought against Glover Shara, I saw it as, all right, Santos was winning that bout. <laughs> Diego Santos was winning. He was. It's just he got he got clipped from an exchange with him and Deshera, which led Deshera finding that opening to go get a takedown in and led to Santos losing. But 90% of that bout was Diego Santos, well, was Diego Santos winning. And because of that, and when you factor that in with someone like Alexander Kish, who prefers the grind-out style battle, where he's going to go poke his opponents, there are, are there two ways of this happening. We can see Thiago Santos just murking Rakish. He's, he's, he's going to try really hard to go like just end him early, either in the first or second round, or Rakish poking with Santos, and Santos being very passive and being unable to engage with Rakish. Because the thing with Santos, though, is that Santos... If he were to drop that middleweight, he pretty much would be like, like Gilbert Burns. This guy who will dom- who's like overwhelmingly strong, very powerful, and he can go take down anybody, and he can just overmatch people with his like striking and his power. That's Diego Santos. But the thing with Diego Santos is that his reach advantage is pretty much non-existent because he doesn't really have it against most of his opponents. And against someone like Alexander Kish, I don't see Diego Santos being able to match the striking accuracy and the angling and the volume as Rakish. What Santos has to do here though is kind of like Derek Lewis versus Curtis Blades where although Derek Lewis he is not the most profound striker out there. He's not the most pretty striker to look at. His striking leaves a lot of question marks and you're looking at it and aesthetically not pleasing but if you land something, he lands something he's going to stun you and I am shocked that he was not able to put away Glover Shera in the two times that looked like Santos was about to put away Glover Shera in their past bouts. So, it's another coin flip here, but I'm picking Santos. Uh, Rakish, depending on how passive and how chaotic, how, how aggressive Santos is, it will determine how Rakish is going to win this bout here. Because if Santos is perfectly fine standing up and it becomes a grind of style battle, Rakish wins. Santos has to finish Rakish here. I don't see Santos winning the fight via decision. And so those are my predictions for the main card for UFC 259. Well, what about the prelims and early prelims? Well, guess what? You just got to go watch the actual show because 
the prelim card, it's stacked. Early prelims, really darn good. And if you really are interested and intrigued into seeing good MMA action from beginning to end, watch the early prelims, watch the prelims. Go grab a bunch of your friends who are healthy, your healthy friends, Bring them all together, go grab some pizza, watch UFC 259, and I can guarantee you, you will find a night full of fun action, really good fights, and I recommend everyone anybody to be excited for this big event for UFC 259. Now, before I go to the news brief portion of the podcast, I do want to bring up one thing, because I am watching the vlog series that are happening that the UFC embedded. They usually do where they follow, they have a camera crew, they follow the fighters, and we have, like, Israel Adesanya, like, giving a car to his mom and dad. We have uh, John Blackwicks is traveling around with his family, like, working out and training. So, Israel Adesanya, he was making a joke about him being drunk before his fight against John Blackwicks. And it's in relation to a report that came out that Polycos has ended up saying that he was hung over the day before. His fights against Israel Asanya. And to me, I think that's to be one of the ridiculous things I've ever seen or heard. I'm not sure if it is like really official or Kos is joking around. But Paulo Costa right now, where his stock is in the FC, has dropped dramatically. And if it turns out to be true that Paulo Costa was drunk in his fight against Israel Asanya. I don't, know what, I don't know what to do. I don't know. We have no reports on what the future is for Paulo Costa. We have none. He wants to go fight against Israel Adesanya. And that ain't happening unless Israel Adesanya end up losing the light heavy title bouts. And also Paulo Costa fighting and defeating his next opponent. We're not sure who he's going to fight. We don't know. We don't know Paulo Costa's next move is. Ever since his bouts with Isa Adesanya, all we're getting from Paulo Costa's Instagram, where I'm like getting some of my information from, it is Paulo Costa saying, "I want the cha- I want to fight against Isa Adesanya. He has respected me. He has respected me. I'm working hard in the gym. The guy's a trash talker. He has no respect. He's an awful human being. He's an awful person." And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, "Dude, you lost the bouts. You lost the bouts months ago." It feels like Israel Asanya and everybody else are just looking forward. Meanwhile, Paulo Costa on his Instagram is constantly complaining, which leads to Luke Rockhold, rock enough. So this is coming in from SMG Sports, where Luke Rockhold is calling out Paulo Costa. So in this headline, with this, this article uh, written by Ishan Batacha, uh, Ishan Batacharya, Paulo Costa, he was looked at as the next big thing in the middle of the division. Things didn't pan out well. And at least to Luke Rockhold is sounding off in his interview he had with Submission Radio. And he called it the most dumbest thing he's ever heard with the idea of Paulo Costa saying that he consumed a bottle of wine ahead of the Adesanya fight, which made him hung over before the bouts. And Costa goes on to say, and I quote, Costa stupid. Talking about getting drunk off wine? This is the dumbest thing I've ever effing heard. Effing, <laughs> like, it's just like, shut up and stop making excuses like that. That's just far-fetched. It's dumb. It's pretty effing dumb. He then, like, goes on to talk about how dumb Paulo Costa is and how, okay, so, this goes back to Luke Rockhold, who might be challenging Paulo Costa because a report's coming in from MMAJoker.com that Luke Rockhold is looking to make a UFC return Sometime this year. He goes on to say, after a recent talk he had with Submission Radio, that the UFC, they've been reaching out, talking, just keeping tabs on my situation, and letting me know that they're interested, as am I, when the time is right, when something really kind of uh, kind of appeals to me, and that's sexy, I want to come back for something that gets me excited. And I want to come back when I'm ready, when my body's ready, and I think early, late summer would be ideal. It's just matching up with the right person and the right thing that's going to put me to where I want. I'm not looking forward to just going off and playing around. I want to go straight to the gut of this division and most likely 185. Not ruling at 205, but I really just got to push my body and get in shape and see where it wants it to go. Right now, I'm light. I'm like 205, 208, which is a natural weight right now. 
And I think that legitimately, it's going to be looking like I'm going to go back to middleweight division, but we will see. If something pops up, you never know. If a fight falls apart, like many injuries do, and COVID and everything that happens, I can be ready sooner than later. And guess what? Paulo Costa, he's got no matchups in the middleweight division. He's got no matchups coming up in the middleweight division. Luke Rockhold wants to go compete at middleweight. He's challenging Paulo Costa. Paulo Costa... It doesn't seem like he's aiming at anybody else right now in the UFC other than Israel Asanya. Now, I'm gonna put this out there. Do I believe Paulo Costa was drunk prior to his bout against Adesanya? No, I don't think so. What happened was Paulo Costa came to the fight trying to attempt leg kicks, trying to make this into a poking battle with a guy who's a counter striker who prefers the long, drawn-out bouts. And Paulo Costa fought Israel Israel Sanya's fighting style. Paulo Costa, what he should have done, was blitzed in at Adesanya without being overly reckless and being able to catch Izzy or make him uncomfortable or overwhelm him before he's able to counter him with a strong left. That's how it is. And by the time Paula Costa attempted to pursue Izzy and try to go in within the range of Izzy, close range, it led to Paula Costa, his leg being severely banged up and him not throwing as much force as he can. And here's another thing. When your leg is banged up and you're bobbing, weaving, and you're moving, you're putting pressure on your leg. And so your movement has been pretty much nullified. And this same thing applied for Conor McGregor versus Poirier where Conor McGregor, his leg was banged up, so he couldn't throw in the amount of energy or the amount of force as he wants to in his punches, and he's going to struggle moving away, bobbing, weaving, dodging strikes, and it limits him on what he can do in the offense. And so it forces Conor McGregor to become a linear striker, linear in his pathway, which makes it easy for his opponent, Dustin Poirier, to go figure out the right openings and the angles to go find the good clear shot to knock down his opponents. And that applied for Costa is Adesanya. I don't know what Paulo Costa was thinking. I don't know what his corner member thinking here. Where we have Paulo Costa saying, come on, hit me in the leg. Hit me in the leg. And then you hit, and then Izzy hits him in the leg. And then nothing is coming out of it where Paulo Costa is utilizing that in a way to go bait him for a clean strike. It's not happening. It ain't. I am 100% certain we're going to see Paulo Costa on his Twitter. He's going to talk about the fight. Or he's going to appear on Instagram Live. And he's going to give a promo about Izzo Adesanya, win or lose, he's going to trash talk him, and that's something I expect. I want to see Paulo Costa back in the octagon. I'm not sure what his status is, I'm not sure what the path is for him right now for the middleweight title, he really wants that belt, but we don't know what the next matchups are for Paulo, and Paulo, he's not challenging or calling it anybody else. So I'm not sure what the future holds for Paulo Costa for this year. You are listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back after the short break. See you soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham! Listen now. And we are back. Welcome back to the news brief portion of the podcast here. As I'll be discussing the current ongoing news of the world of mixed martial arts. And what's going on with Kamza Chimaev? Well, it appears that he has announced his retirement. But Dana White says Star is emotional. Will return. I'm reading this right now from MMAfighting.com. Written by Steve Morocco. Kamza Chimaev appeared to announce his retirement from MMA three weeks after lingering COVID-19 symptoms for his attempt to withdraw from UFC Vegas 21. But UFC President Dana White said that the rising UFC welterweight star is actually readying for a June comeback. Chimaev wrote on Instagram, translated from Russian, he goes to say thank you all so much for supporting me and my journey in the sports. I think I'm done. He added this while he didn't win a title. It's not the most important victory in his life. It may upset you, but my heart and body... Tell me everything. Later, Chimaev posted a picture on his Instagram story that showed a spray of what happened to be blood in a sink. 
The main thing is I do not know what this is what this disease is, but it is not easily outlived. He wrote in a message translated on Reddit. Multiple messages to uh, Chimeyev's management and the FC immediately were returned, but White subsequently told MMA Junkie that he'd spoken to the fighter and clarified his plans. The UFC recently flew Chimeyev to its home city of Las Vegas for a treatment, and White said that the fallout of his recovery motivated the apparent retirement post. Dana White goes on to say, and I quote, When he got here, the doctors took care of him, and they put him on Predisone, which is a nasty effing steroid. So he's on Predisone, and he's supposed to be taking this thing and chilling, relaxing, let himself recover. He went in and effing trained today, felt like uh, felt bad, and got super emotional and posted that. He's not supposed to be training, but you know, this guy's a savage. He wants to fight like every effing weekend, and now he can't even train. So he just got emotional and posted that, but he ain't quitting. According to his reps, Jumeyev has been hospitalized multiple times after being stricken with multiple health issues, receiving antibiotics from bronchitis. In a behind-the-scenes video, his manager, Maji Shamas, said that the fighter started cuffing after two rounds of work in preparation for the March 13 fight in Las Vegas. He was later taken to a local hospital, Shamas said the fighter later told him he thought he was going to die. And I remember reading that actually where Shamayev really is at a point now where he does believe his health concerns is so bad that he thinks he's going to die soon. Announcing uh, Chimaev's, uh, Chimaev's scratch, Dana White said that the 26-year-old fighter was suffering from an issue with his lungs. It was the third time this bout has been cancelled after a COVID-19 positive Nix Edwards from UFC Vegas 17 booked and complications from the virus ruled Chimaev out of UFC Vegas 19. Dana White goes on to continue saying, and I quote, He was flown out here so that we could take care of him. We get him taken care of. They've got they got him on medica- on medication. He's going to be fine, and he's going in and he starts effing training. He's not supposed to be training, and he's super frustrated. He's training when he's supposed to be resting. He's got to stay off, and at least while he's on this medication. Here is the full statement from Chimaev. By the way, this is being translated, and so he goes on to say that I want to say thank you all so much for supporting me in my journey in this sports. I think I'm done. Yes, I know I didn't take the belt, but it's not the most important victory in his life. It may upset you, but my heart and body tell me everything. I want to say a big thank you to my team, All-Star Training Center. I want to say a big thank you to the UFC. So, what is the status of Kamaz Jumayev? I have to talk about Dana White and how he perceives Khabib here. Because we're getting very similar things here where we've got... Dana White, no, no, we've got the fighter, comes to Chimaev and Khabib Nurmagomedov, to continue to say that they are retiring, they are retiring, they're not in the right place mentally, emotionally, health-wise, and they're keeping it simple. They want to retire. Then we have Dana White saying, no, no, he doesn't actually believe in that. He's just being over-emotional. And the same thing happened with, with Khabib. He says, oh, the only reason why Khabib said that he retired is because he's being over-emotional. Trust me, he wants to fight. I know it. I saw that man's eyes. He wants to fight. So I'm at the point now where I cannot believe anything Dana White is saying. If you want to know what what the fighter is thinking about, we just have to wait. We just have to wait on what is happening with Kamza Chumayev. If he does get booked, then he's booked. It's similar to Khabib. Like, is Khabib retired? Well, here's the thing. If he's not available to fight for a set amount of time, he's not available. If he's not available, then he's not active. If he's not active, then for us, for as far as we know, he's retired. If a, if a fighter says he's retired, then they're retired. It's all strange because I remember... There was controversy happening with um, Anthony Smith. And the controversy was, even Dana and I talked about it, where if a fighter doesn't want to fight, they don't have to fight then. It's perfectly fine. They're going to go find some other fighter. And for Anthony Smith, he didn't want to fight in the middle, in his bouts. Uh, I forgot who the exact matchup was, but he was in a bout where he was being completely wrecked. And it he told the coach, like, no, like, I don't I don't think I'm ready, essentially. He didn't say that. He didn't say the little words, I don't want to fight. But he's alluding to the fact that he was in no condition to go fight. And he didn't want to fight. But his coach was like, you know what? Go there. Keep fighting. There's controversy happening there because there was a lot of flack and criticism going in the way of Anthony Smith's cornermen saying, yeah, we should have, like, stopped the fight. You should have stopped the fight. 
Anthony Smith should not fight. If a fighter doesn't want to fight, they don't have to fight. And Dana White says it every single time in a post fight presser where he says, we're not forcing these fighters to fight. If they don't want to fight, then they don't want to fight. We'll move on. He always says that. And remember, according to him, it's not a career. It's an opportunity. And if it's an opportunity, you are not required to take that opportunity. You're not required. So I'm pretty sure Dana White, he wants Khabib to fight. He, want, he wants Kamza to fight. Will they fight? Well, guess what? They're grown adults. No one is going to force him to fight. Now, Dana White and the UFC press, they can peer pressure him to fight. Dana White, no, no, I'm pretty sure that Khabib has felt the pressure from Dana White. That he's been peer pressured by Dana White. And at the point is right, right now where, where Khabib is, he, eyes how I see it, he knows himself more than anyone else. And he knows that he doesn't want to disappoint his mother. And he doesn't want to fight. Kamzat, he doesn't have to fight if he doesn't want to. And he shouldn't be pressured by Dana White. With his like, hey man, you're fine. You're just being over emotional. Come on. Scott there and fight. If Kamzat doesn't want to fight, guess what? He's not going to get in trouble. And here's, and here's the thing. If Kamzat Chemayev does want to fight. But he wants to take like an extended break. There are other avenues out there. He can compete at PFL, at Bellator. He can compete at one championships if he wants to. One of the things I do like about MMA in the year of 2021 uh, is the fact that we are seeing an expansion of MMA organizations and MMA fighters looking towards the other organizations for being real alternative means of making money. It used to be a thing where you got to go put your foot in the UFC. That's how you become successful as an MMA fighter. Not anymore. You can be a BKFC fighter. You can compete at one championship. You can compete at Bellator. It's all up to you. We are seeing a lot more agency in the fighter side of things. And with the things are going right now with agency and hustling being a real thing in America, over 50% of uh, people are hustling and finding alternative means of making money. And are, and are not exclusively making money through one specific avenue. I can see Kamza Chimaev saying, you know what, I'm going to take a break here, let me really think about this, and if I don't want to come back to the UFC, I'll compete somewhere else. I can see that. Like, Khabib, despite being the lightweight champion for the UFC, he doesn't have to fight. He doesn't have to. So, as of right now, unless I hear it specifically from those fighters, from Kamza himself... From Khabib himself, they're retired for all I know. Speaking of fighter agency, this is a report coming in from MMAJuki.com, written by Danny Segura. Headline being following UFC release, Marcus Perez excited to reset career. Sometimes it's better to take a step back. The Millway fighter said he is in no way down about his departure from his MMA promotion, UFC. Earlier this month, Perez is 12-5 in his MMA career, 2-5 in his UFC career. Left the UFC on a three-fight losing skid, with the most recent debut coming in from a decision loss to Dacha Lungbela in January. He goes on to say, and their quotes, I feel better now out of the UFC. I really do, he told MMA Junkie. When I lost fights in the UFC, you start, you start to feel bad, and you get depression, and people talk a lot of smack about you. You have depression because of the money, and now I have a son, you know, so it's complicated. But now I feel better. I feel free. I feel free to restart my career. And I feel better like that. Perez's career didn't pan out the way he expected to. Uh, the Brazilian entered the UFC back in 2017, went through a losing streak after being undefeated and winning the LFA middleweight title prior before joining the UFC. At 30 years old, Perez said he still feels like he has a lot to show for in his MMA career and is determined to bounce back in his winning ways. He goes on to say, and I'll quote, I know who I am. I know my potential. I know my talents. I know everything for me. Taking the UFC belt is my dream, but sometimes it's better to take a step back so you can go up four or five steps after. Per said he's interested in joining big promotions in PFL or Bellator. He says he likes the $1 million prize that PFL has to offer, but also likes the potential of fighting for Dylan Danis in Bellator. Perez says, and I quote, I want to fight in PFL. In PFL, if you win five fights, you take $1 million and you take a belt. For me, this is the best vision for my life right now. PFL, take the bell, take the money, invest the money, stay good. I don't need to work 
in construction or security at a nightclub and focus on fighting. And maybe, who knows, come back to the UFC, take the belt. But if Bellator offers, hey, you want to fight Dylan Dennis? Then, okay, I'm here. It's not about the money. It's about shutting this guy up. He talks a lot of mess. So, you know what, Perez, he seems pretty positive. He seems pretty positive, and you know what? If he's happy, then, you know what, we should be happy for him. Former Bellator heavyweights, Bobby Lashley is now the champion for the WWE. Yes, heavyweight Bobby Lashley is now the WWE World Heavyweight Champion for the WWE. Congratulations for Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley, I am still excited over the prospect and idea of Lashley versus Lesnar. And I think the WWE, they were trying to push Brock Lesnar versus Lashley being an actual event happening at one of their bigger shows. But that didn't happen, which is very upsetting. Because I still remember when Brock Lesnar was the UFC Heavyweight Champion, there's a lot going on about, oh man, what would happen if Bobby Lashley, when he was doing Belter May uh, training at American Top Team, what would happen if Lashley fought against Lesnar? It was a proper dream fight. Now, would that fight be the most pretty looking fight out there in the world? No, obviously it wouldn't. But it would be like the sheer spectacle of seeing these two gigantic dudes from two different eras in pro wrestling meet each other from different organizations. It was a dream fight that a lot of people wanted to see. And even right now, as a pro wrestling fan, I want to see Lashley versus Lesnar in some capacity. If they're not going to fight each other in a legitimate fight, I still want to see it in pro wrestling. So, Bobby Lashley, he has stepped away from the cage working as a full-time pro wrestler for the WWE. He seems like things are going well for him as he is the world champion. First time being the world champion for the organization since his initial debut back in 2005. So it's been 16 years. He's working 16 years trying to become the world champion for this organization. Now, obviously, the guy took a step back. He left the WWE to pursue a career in MMA fighting, to pursue a career in Bellator, in the independent wrestling scene, in TNA Impact Wrestling. So Lashley, he's went through a long path, but he was able to become the guy, the champion for uh, uh, for the company. Bobby Lashley was incredibly emotional. You can tell by his face that he was at the brink of crying upon winning this fictional belt. So you know what? Good on for Bobby Lashley. As a fan of pro wrestling and of mixed martial arts, I am happy for Lashley. The guy deserves it. The fact that this, like him and Yo Romero despite their ages, look like proper titans, like athletic, physical specimens. And the fact that they are continuing to go compete and become better as time goes on. I was like, for Yael Romero, eh, kind of second that, guess, guessing that. But for Bobby Lashley, to look as good as he is, and to be a physical specimen like him, who is still succeeding and achieving stuff in life in his late 40s, two thumbs up, congratulations for Bobby Lashley for winning the WWE World Heavyweight Belt. There is speculation happening that Bobby Lashley might be the main event for WrestleMania. So if you're interested to see Bobby Lashley, former MMA fighter for Bellator, former undefeated fighter, well, you're going to see him at the grandest stage of them all at WrestleMania for the WWE if you are still a pro wrestling fan. I say this as both a pro wrestling fan and an MMA fan. You would be surprised at how similar both pro wrestling and MMA is. They kind of blend in together, and that's why just it's interesting to see somebody like Brock Lesnar and for Bobby Lashley to go jump between sports and be successful. Really interesting. And so with that being said, once again, we have UFC 259, huge major event, champion versus champion, three title bouts happening this Saturday at the UFC Apex Facility Building. All I gotta say is thank you. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Oh, 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 oh